Hey guys, good to see you again. Uh, this is my second in a series of, of why big bucks are so difficult to hunt. And uh, what we're going to be talking today about is whitetail memories. <laughs> Whitetails have amazing memory, memories and most hunters fail to realize that. And uh, it's not just a matter of being older. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why some have better memories than others, but most of them, have, when they get to be like three and a half to six and a half year old bucks, they have amazing memories. And it's good to know that. I mean, this should, this affects how you should hunt these deer. So, let's talk about that a little bit. Now, I mentioned it before, I, you know, I've hunted whitetails, or hunted and, and studied whitetails over a good part of the United States. And, uh, the areas where I've spent a great number of years, years and years and years doing it, are in Minnesota, of course, and uh, western Wisconsin, and uh, 18 years down in Texas, uh, New Mexico, and Arizona. Many years, you know, so we're looking at deer quite different from our boreal forests in northern Minnesota and farm areas and prairie and southwestern part mixed farm areas in Wisconsin, and, uh, down there in uh, the plains, the state plains of Texas, you know, up near the Panhandle, and uh, uh, some of the mountainous areas in, uh, in New Mexico and in desert areas like the Sonoran Desert uh, in southwestern uh, Arizona. They're quite different, different places. I've hunted in the area of whitetails and swamps and, and, and bogs and various parts of Minnesota for quite a few years and done pretty well hunting in those areas, really tough to hunt. But, but so what I've learned about their memories is true of whitetails everywhere. And it's good, good to know that. You know, the whitetails aren't just whitetails. There's, the, you know, when you see, the deer you see most in the woods are yearlings and fawns, and younger does with young. Like say a two and a half year old doe has got young, that deer isn't really that prepared herself for teaching her young what they need to know to avoid humans. So those are vulnerable deer out there. And uh, bucks are not in the same class as those deer at all. And I've talked to you about why, you know, they live alone quite a bit of the time and so they, they have developed different ways of, of avoiding human hunters. And um, what, what one big buck does isn't necessarily the same thing that another big buck is going to do to avoid you. But most of the bucks that we'd like to take, we dream of taking, they're at least three and a half to six and a half year old bucks. And by that time, they've been avoiding you for three to six years, and uh, successfully. You haven't, uh, when they get to be like four and a half to six and a half, you don't even see them if you hunt the way everybody else hunts whitetails. Or if you stand hunt the way everybody else stands on. You know, sit in a portable tree stand in one place for a whole hunting season, watching your food plot or using door, lure sets of various kinds, rattling antlers, using call, all those things. You, those, those deer that are three and a half, well, four and a half to six and a half years are masters at finding you and identifying you and avoiding it, and they do it quickly. If you're close, if you're not close to where they are, uh, you can go for days and days and days without one of those big guys even being anywhere around you, and that in itself can make it difficult uh, for you to hunt big bucks. You know, like on this map, I said, this, where are those big bucks going to be? You don't even know until uh, you start thinking about this, and you start by scouting and finding the trails that where the big bucks uh, are. The trails are using feeding areas, are using bedding areas, all of these things. Then you're starting to get a good idea, but but still, it, that in itself can make it hunting difficult too, because wherever you hunt close to these big bucks, and I keep saying that, uh, big bucks will generally find you 
at a stand sign. First time you ever use the first time you ever use this stand sign, if it's close to where they are active today, based on their fresh signs, uh, within one to two hours, that quickly. That's kind of sad. But until you start hunting in a way that takes that into account, you still aren't going to see many big bucks. Uh, so, so it's important to understand how good their memories are. And here's why, you know, during all the years I've been studying them, and I've been impressed by this, and even with older does, older does and older bucks, they remember you the rest of their lives. Once they've, once they've learned to, to find you in the woods where you hunt, where you like to hunt, if you've been hunting there for two or more years, they know you really, really well. They know what you what you sound like, you know, the, voice, the sounds you make that are characteristic of you, your voice, uh, maybe your sneeze. Some guys have voices you can hear a half mile away, even when they aren't talking very loud. My dad had a voice like that. One of my sons has a voice like that. But you can hear them way in the devil a long way away. And they hear that, so oh, that hunter's back again. Here. And they expect you back. Every year, they, they re these older bucks recognize prior to deer hunting. Up where I hunt, you know, in the wilderness areas, the nearest public roadway is a gravel road. And it's deep out in the this big wilderness area. And there isn't a lot of travel on that road during the year. Well, you go some, there's a couple of fishing lakes out there people go to, but they don't go every day. And, but come fall, there's more and more traffic going up and down that gravel road. You can hear the trucks and pickups and cars rumbling a mile, two miles away, on that, rumbling on, the, on those gravel roads. And it's a boy, that's picking up, and uh, more and more people are, are being in the woods. And small game hunting is going on early, like grouse hunting. <laughs> that opens, what, on the middle of September, and gee, you got all kinds of guys shooting shot, uh, shotguns out there and along the roads, you know, road hunting, and, and which isn't the best way to hunt grouse as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, uh, but there's more and more of that, and those bigger bucks that have been around a while, those four and a half to six and a half year olds, well, these are bucks in their prime, big bucks. They know, oh, oh it's hunting is happening. Pretty soon the deer hunters are going to be out here. And then, before the season began, begins, there's guys out there scouting all over the woods and laying trail scent all over the woods. They smell, oh, this guy's back. He remembers your trail scent from the year before. They'll never forget how you smell. You don't smell like all the other hunters. Everybody has different, their odors are different. Just like your dog, <laughs> he doesn't have to see you when he smells you uh, to know it's you. If somebody else comes in the room, and especially if it's somebody he doesn't know you before, my dog, boy, he start barking. Well, oh, there's so there's a stranger in my house, and he's got to do his his guard guard duty to start with. Uh, he smells. Here's the noise. Your voice that's different. Bark, bark. So. White tails are the same way. They hear that all these sounds that you normally make. They remember them for the rest of their lives. Yeah, one one good example of that is a is a buck Jane and I, my wife and I, got to know uh, quite a few years ago. And uh, he lived on a in a winter time. He was with a bunch of other deer on the top of a limestone bluff in western Wisconsin, a good place to go and photograph deer. But not that they were easy, they were tough to get good close range shots of in the beginning. The very first time I went up there, there was this flood. You know, he wasn't spotted, it was, this was in, around the first of the year. So he was probably about 90 pounds about that time. And uh, our farms get to be that size by then. And uh, so, uh, I was going to get a picture of him back in those days. <clears throat> we didn't have digital cameras. Everything had to be set by the hunter and the focus and f-stops and all those kind of things had to be set. So I'm setting, getting it all set, and he sees me and he starts coming right toward me, walking kind of fast. 
and he's coming and coming, and I keep trying to focus on him, and pretty soon there's a nose print on my lens of my camera. He was he was just fascinated by that, and I thought that was really queer, but he was this was friendly little thing, <laughs> and so. Uh, from that time, you know, at that trip, uh, he kind of hung around. You know, he'd come, keep coming back, and, and uh, my wife and I always carried snacks with us when we were out in the woods, you know, photographing White House. And uh, well, a lot of it in the beginning in that area was with long lenses. You know, they were way over there somewhere. But he would come up to us, and so I was eating potato chips one day, and sort of come out in the snow, and he went over and sniffed that. And, Sort of bright. Boy, his eyes literally, oh, I like that. <laughs> so he kept around until he had eaten most of my potato chips. Well, the next trip we went back and we sure he brought potato chips and I brought some ham and ends with peanuts for myself. And sure enough, we got up there. We, didn't have a, we just got up there and he's, a lot of deer were moving very right quickly. Here comes some people and humans. And, but here comes this fawn. Well, he wasn't a fawn, he was a yearling now. There were little antlers on him, and he comes running over and he's like, oh, I'm going to have my potato chips. So I throw some out for him, and he liked those. And then I was going to put a couple of M&Ms in my mouth, and he seemed like he was interested in that, so I threw him a couple of those. And he went over there and threw, oh, boy, <laughs> he said, that was really good. Those peanuts in there really got him. And so I ended up sharing all my, my M&Ms as well with that deer. Well, as every year we kept going back and it kept getting bigger and bigger. Pretty soon it was a big ten point. No different boy comes running over. I have to give him an M Ms. And you know, those kind of things like potato chips and M Ms had a plastic wrapper that kind of crackles, you know. And all I had to do when he got there was crackle a package, and here he comes. He'd hear that, but he remembered the sound, you know. Remembered me. Remembered the sound. We. We never went there more than once a year, but he never forgot. Never forgot me, he never forgot potato chips, he never forgot M&Ms with peanuts in it. And the, all the rest of his life. Same way down in Texas, you know, we back into a favorite campsite we went to year after year, and uh, my wife was always trying to make pets out of deer down there, and uh, we'd give them corn. You know, you buy dried corn now. You could do that down in Texas, and you could put corn in a little dish, put it over in the ground. And, but she would name deer like Mama and Apple, and then. When Apple died, she named her daughter Apple. They were white-legged deer, different than the other ones there. But anyway, uh, we could, I'd pull in while I'm getting things set up. Well, she'd be out there going, Mama! In minutes, five, fifteen minutes, there comes Mama. She was a dominant doe, and in winter they were kind of, they would form gr larger girls, her herds. And she was the she was the boss deer in the, in the herd of of those with young. And she had a long jug head, real different looking. And here she comes. <laughs> and they they remember Jean's voice. Jean had a voice that somehow made her seem harmless to deer. If I had talked to them, they weren't sure about that. But with Jean's voice, they were fooled every time. From running over, after give them call, oh boy, we're gonna get traits, we're gonna get corn. And this one deer that loved apples, she had cut up apples in little slices, and toss them over there. <laughs> they did that every year. But for We had deer doing that every year for eight, 18 years. They never forgot us wherever we went, whether it was there or Buffalo Lake National Wildlife Refuge or, or uh, Santa Catalina Mountains in Arizona. Those deer remembered us from year to year. They remembered our voices, they remembered the sounds our vehicle made, they, they, everything. Well, your whitetails are doing the same thing to you where you are. They remember, and especially those older deer, those 
big trophy bucks. They know the sounds you make. All right, they know the sound your vehicle makes. They know the sound that your ATV or snowmobile or your or your OHV, your off highway vehicle, they know the sounds those make. What's worse than that is uh, they remember, well, they remember what you smell like too, you know, you're different. They remember, my wife smelled probably a lot nicer to them than, they, than I smelled to them, but they remember their odors as well. They remember, I, there was two does that were in my first study here in Aiken Colony, Minnesota. They not only remembered me, but they remembered, and my odors, but they remembered my trail scents. They were never uh, alarmed. They, they well in the beginning they were, but they got so they were never alarmed upon finding my fresh trail scent in the woods. Um, they could walk on the trail over there and lay down a little further away where they in their bedding area and never be alarmed by that at all. But other deer would be alarmed, but not them. And they remembered my trail scent from year to year to year. Those same ones, the black hair what I call the black ear doe and the, and the redhead. And they were always around the camp and bring their young in there in the camp. But, but the point is, once they discover what you smell like, the sounds you make, and even what you look like, the way you walk is different. You know, you know if you're a hunter who stops often when you're going through the woods, you know, and I'm going to convince you of this one of these days, you know, that you, we've all been taught that when you're hunting deer, you should stop every once and check and look around, and you will take a few steps and stop. You sound just like a deer that's feeding. That's, it, that's incredibly wrong. There's no way a human, big-footed human, is going to sound like a feeding deer. And, uh, you know, when feeding deer, they even chew on things, and that's chewing is, you can hear it, you know. I got this one video of this doe standing, I chomp, 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 chomp. You'll see it right here. Just to remind you, you don't do those things. Uh, and if you're doing it where there's no deer food, like that, there's deer with, who are you trying to kid? There's no deer feeding over in that area. Those are sounds more typical of a wolf or bear stalking the deer, stopping and listening and looking, freezing. That's a hunting human that does that. It's not a deer that's feeding, no way. Well, anyway, if you do that all the time, this man, oh yeah, and that's the guy that stops every while. I don't want to be anywhere near where he is. Well, that's going to be easy to because he always goes on this trail. And let's say you're standing there and he always goes and sits in that tree. They've been doing that for years now and he'll sit there the whole season, which is really nice because I don't have to worry about him. I mean, I see you know, I'll check early, see if he's still there, and every now and then I'll pass downwind of that spot. I'll deliberately go downwind in cover. Top oh yeah, he's still there. Hasn't changed, you know. If you got a new stand, say the following year, if you did it right, you're, if you're going to be close to where that buck is on the morning, which is what you want to do, you know, but he's going to get you real quick, and then from then on, he's going to be keeping track of that as well. And uh, some bucks will do that daily. They, they want to be sure it's going to be safe for them to be anywhere else in that vicinity or in his home range, um, because he knows, oh, you're there, I don't have to worry about you. So they know that. And you, it, until you realize that, you see how hopeless it is, what you've been doing, trying to get a big buck all these years? Why it's so hard? You know, you can't keep hunting that way. You've got to start changing things. And one of the things we do, you know, there's a lot of things we do, but one basic thing is to change stamp sites often. And we used to, we used to say, well, let's, we'll sit there for two days. And we got it down to one day. And finally, when we found enough tracks in snow during the hunting season where a buck had passed downwind of where we were sitting and then walked away without us even realizing they were there. Those darn things, they get you within the first one to two hours. If you don't see them, they, they got you. 
Now, there could be a reason that buck was somewhere else instead that day, maybe. During the night, a doe and he went in the heat over there a quarter mile away or over there a mile away, and they can smell him a mile away. So that's why he didn't come by here today. But nine times out of ten, they get you. Those kind of bucks will get you during the first one to two hours you sit at a stand site for the first time. Or if you return to this previous year's stand site, the first time you come back and sit there, they've got you. Now, uh, and if you only used it once during the previous season, they might remember, well, they'll probably remember you used this, they might check on that sometime soon to see if you're there. Oh, you're not here. Well then, but that isn't the end of it. They, they'll still keep track of. It's like we we've got one spot we camp in our where we hunt, and uh, we put up our 20 foot long tent, which I dearly love, <laughs> and we've been camping at that spot for a long time now. We, we we've changed our campsite three times in the 30 years we've hunted there, but. This is where we hunt now, and partly because it's hard to find a flat spot 20 feet long in that woods, and this one is one of those, so we use it. Well, we have we have a doe with young who, who beds within 75 yards of that tent, and we, a buck, my son John got, walked behind the tent. It couldn't have been, I don't know, maybe 50, 100 yards behind it, but walked past that shortly before John got it. Right back of our tent, walked up there. It was, those deer were, they were not concerned as long as they always knew where we were. Well, when that when that buck walked, took a little step to the left there, and I think he was thinking he was hearing, smelling this doe and he, and saw John there, he was the most confused buck around. <laughs> what in the heck's going on here? What is that? You know, this hunt, people don't, there's never a hunter here, we, you know, and all of a sudden it was a big surprise to him. And, and he paused long enough to, for John to shoot him, <laughs> and that worked out. But it's a good example what those what those deer know, and sometimes it doesn't work out. Because, but every time you move to a new spot close to where a buck is active now, you've got a spot where your odds are very good, at least for a couple hours, maybe first time we sit there, for some reason it didn't work. The first day maybe the weather was bad, or in our case some moose were bedding there, and the white tails hate them and stay away from them, screw everything up with all their snorting and that kind of thing. Um, but the, anytime you're sitting somewhere where you've never sat before, big bucks don't know it at, in the beginning. And every once in a while, when they, they'll walk close because they don't realize you're there because you've made the change, you get the buck, or they're searching for you. And we have, we've had many bucks over the years that made it a point to search for you every morning before they felt safe. And when they did, we've had bucks that would bed, they would decide, I'm not going back to my bedding, I'm going to bed right here where I can keep an eye on that guy when he's sitting over there. Like, I had a spot there, I wasn't. 60 feet up on, a, in, on the top of a cliff and he was down here in this brush full of ferns that deep and the same color as the deer fur and he'd lay down in there and when I discovered him doing that, yeah, that really was something I just shook my head and said, how do you hunt a buck like that? How do you successfully hunt a buck that does that? So, but part of what they start with every year, they know all about you. And if you keep doing the same things, you're duck soup for them, easy for them to avoid. So you got to make it evolve. you got to change. you got to keep changing. Yeah, my old hunting partner, Silver, he had a favorite spot. I mean, it was a good spot to sit, but yeah, he's it, getting up there in age and he didn't want to have to walk great distance to stand sites anymore. And this one always looked good. He, sitting on a hillside where you could watch uh, a narrow opening on a clear cut. It's all grassy down there and every time we went up there, uh, in the beginning of a scene, there was always a lot of deer tracks there and he'd go, oh man, this is great, and he'd be upwind and be up there and he'd sit there. 
And meanwhile, while he was sitting there, I was changing stance lights every half day all around him. And one day, I decided to go on up this old logging trail. It's all getting all grown up, but uh, and I went only about. It couldn't have been more than 75 yards. But I was going up the trail, and some nice big buck jump, one jump across the trail and heading out, heading south from there. And I didn't have a chance for a shot. I was completely by surprise. I was going up there. The place I was going to was about half a mile further up that way. And boom, big bone, and I got up there. And here, underneath a big spruce tree with sagging boughs on, this buck had been laying there facing downhill, and when I got, I went over to that and I looked back, I could see silver. Now that buck, looking at that bed, now the tracks are on the dropping, they've been bedding there a lot, probably the whole deer season, where he could keep an eye on silver. And I'd come out of the woods and we'd get together and we'd go to camp for lunch, then the buck could move around and we'd sometimes find his tracks right on our tracks. We had another buck doing in the same spot, same deal, walking on our tracks where, where, while we were in camp. We'd come back and, geez, this buck had been walking over our tracks. I never did get that big one that left, leaped across, but there was an example of a buck keeping track of a hunter at a really close range. And Silver so sitting there with his back to this buck for several days and never realized it. One day, you know, this buck was going over to another side, and I thought, well, they like to feed in this little narrow place here. We come back, and I said, Silver, I'm going to go up to the edge of this clear cut. I'm going to be on a downwind side, and I'm going to go over there and sit there this afternoon. Well, hour and a half later, he comes, the buck, <laughs> feeding on there, feeding on uh, red stems uh, coming off uh, suckers or of sugar mills coming off stumps in the clear cut, and I dropped them in his tracks about 100 yards straight, straight west of where I sat. So that worked. But you know, it it, it would be hard for most guys to imagine that big bucks, older bucks, could be keeping track of you so close. So close to where you're sitting in a stand, in a tree, or on the ground, in a blind, and, or where you, close to where, you, where you're camped out in the woods, um, those darn things are that good without you realizing it. And when you get snow on the ground, you start to realize, oh, geez, look at these big tracks there, you know. Now you get down out of your tree stand, and you're going to go back for lunch, or it's in the evening, and there's big tracks on top of your tracks downwind of where you're sitting. Well, downwind, he got you for sure, you know, no problem. You're dead in the water then when that happens. So, <clears throat> but if you hunt in the area you don't have snow, believe me, that's happening all the time even though you don't realize it. You might come heading back, you know, in the evening and hear really fresh droppings made by a big buck, like say, Oh, anywhere from three quarters to one and a quarter inches in length, and they're shiny. That was a big buck that did it. If that was downwind of where you sat that day, he's got you. He's got you. So, so, you see, knowing things like this about big bucks are important to the way you hunt. It gives you reason to change, to do something different, because you, you're just making it hard on yourself, making it very difficult to take an older buck by doing the same things year after year, and big bucks never forget that. They know the trails you use, they know the stance that you use, uh, they recognize your trail sense, your airborne sense, your sounds you make, everything. Uh, and so they're prepared for that. Oh, he's here now. So, a lot of those older bucks say he lives in this range and your trail always goes to this place. He's probably going to make it a point to be downwind somewhere of that trail. And, oh yeah, here he comes. <laughs> and, and then maybe pass downwind of the trail. Have that stance I used last year, the one you think is going to be a hot spot for big bucks because you got pictures on your trail can of the big buck there. That big buck is already making fun of you. 
Well, you got pictures of, oh, I can't wait to get this big buck. And you keep going back to him, putting down more trail set for that buck. And, oh, man, he's spending, he's putting, he's busy here. He comes back here a lot. That's going to be a dangerous place to be. Your, your nice big food plot here, the one you got now, that goes way up there somewhere. Every year you make it bigger and you're pinning yourself to that spot and making it really easy for that buck to avoid you. And, or you go to the same spot and you use lure set the same old way every year and your scent goes down with, with the lure scent and so that's duck soup for that deer. He not only smells the lure scent, but he smells you there. You know, he's not going to be a sucker and go over there where that lure scent's coming from. Or rattling antlers or call or whatever you use. To, do the fun thing, bleat with the can, all those things. They work for initially, but everybody overworks them, use them too much. And you train those deer, just like the foxes, my brother and I used to have with a predator call. Boy, they, they train real quick, they realize it. They hear us call, the predator, oh, they want to come there. There's a dying rabbit over there, but I know. There's a human, those are humans making noise, and they bark, you will sit there and bark in frustration. Deer remember those things as well. So you just keep making it easy for them. You can't keep hunting the way you are and expect to take big bucks. And once in a while you might get lucky, but not often. The average hunter probably only gets one to three, one to two uh, trophy class bucks in a lifetime. You can do it every year <laughs> if you want. You can. We do it every. My boys and I do it every year for 30 years now. I'm taking a lot of bucks. I I hate to even say how many now. I don't want to sound like I'm bragging. But it's an example of what we're doing. How good it is. We've taken 105 mature bucks in 30 years doing the things I'm teaching. Okay, guys. Um, that's it for this session, you know, talking about memories of, of white tails, especially older bucks, and why what they remember makes it so easy for them to avoid you during the hunting season. So keep that in mind, you know, the buck you want to get, he knows you, <laughs> he's expecting you, he knows you know, countless ways to identify you, countless ways to, to Determine where you are hunting now without being in danger. So that's the reason you think there aren't any really big bucks where you hunt. Something needs to be done about it. So you don't. You, to, if you, the only way to stop that, you know, and to start seeing those bucks, is catch them by surprise by being in a new stand site every half day or every day if you, if you can't. If you think you can't find that many stand sites every day during the hunting season, but change often, and then you'll start catching them by surprise. So with that now, well, let's quit for this session. Uh, be sure to poke that red button down there to subscribe to my YouTube channel, and poke that thumbs up button too, would you please? And with that, uh, thanks for coming, and I'll see you again soon. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my eBooks, my son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries, my website bookstore, and much more.